Okay, for the key gate, good morning to you all. Professor uh, Penasia, welcome. Um, so, this morning we're going to be looking at what happened in the election this year and why. So, what we're going to do is look at what happened and um, why. <laughs> so, I thought it would be useful just to start with a brief reminder of the election result itself. So, you know, Labour, quite a long way ahead in votes and even further in seats. Like Henry narrowly edging uh, Conservatives out of second place, to the UKIP emerging in a strong fourth place, and the Liberal Democrats for the first time ever slipping back into fifth. And this result reflected the following vote share changes from 2011. So we see Labour slipping back in really quite a long way in terms of vote share on both the constituency and regional ballot, but only losing one seat. Conservatives slipping back rather further, sorry, slipping back rather less, but losing three seats. Liberal Democrats slipping back least of all, but losing four. And I'll discuss in a few minutes quite how we, we got that sort of result. But we also see, of course, Ply Cymru going up a little bit on the constituency vote, a bit more on the regional vote and UKIP uh, rising quite considerably on both. Albeit the constituency vote share rise is a bit misleading because of course they didn't stand constituency candidates five years ago. But anyway, for, first of all I thought we should look at these results in a little bit more detail and evaluate them um, one party at a time. And of course we'll begin, as we always begin in Welsh politics, with, with the Labour Party. So, um, Labour came first. That's what they do, Welsh elections. This was in the last 38 Wales-wide electoral contests. This was the 37th time that Labour had come first. The only exception is the 2009 European election in a run which began in 1922. At the same time, this was, however, you know, in some respects, a relatively poor performance by the Labour Party, at least in terms of vote share. This was, on both ballots, their second worst ever assembly election result. You know, Labour was doing quite a lot worse in terms of vote share than they'd done under Alan Michael in 1999. And if we look across the detailed constituency results, we see Labour's vote share actually going down in all but three of the seats from five, five years, years ago. ago. The three where it went up are listed here. The first two, probably not coincidentally, with the two seats where UKIP did not stand a constituency candidate, Arvon and Aberconwy. However, you know, even with the vote share declining in 37 or 40 seats, but for the result in Ronda, Labour would have emerged completely unscathed in terms of seat numbers, which is a pretty remarkable performance. The party that came second was Ply Cymru, and that's I suppose, you know, the main bit of good news for Ply Cymru from the results, re-establishing themselves as the second party in the Assembly. But if you start to look in a bit more detail at the results, the performance starts to look very patchy indeed. And this was you know, a result achieved on the basis of only pretty modest gains in vote share, particularly on the constituency ballot. And indeed, on the constituency ballot, this was Plaid's second worst ever assembly election, worse even than they did in, in 2003. And in a majority of the seats, 22 of the 40, Plaid Cymru's constituency vote share actually fell, you know, fell in comparison to the disastrous performance in 2011. So this was no great sort of nationwide surge behind Plaid Cymru. Plaid did have, of course, a number of very good performances in particular constituencies. They had the three best vote share changes listed here. Um, they also had, of course, a double-digit percentage vote share rise in Cardiff West as well. But look, and it's worth looking at the places where Plaid had its worst constituency vote share changes. They include Carmarthen, West and South Pembrokeshire, and Clonethley. So two of Plaid's three worst vote share changes on 2011 were in its two most obvious target constituency seats. Something's gone a bit wrong there. 
Final thing to point out with regard to Plaid is on, on the regional vote share changes. Um, the, the regions that we would regard as containing the sort of places we tend to think of as Plaid's traditional heartlands in the north and west of, of Wales, so the North Wales region, Mid and West Wales region, actually saw only very small changes in the Plaid uh, regional vote, um, up a bit in North Wales, actually down marginally on 2011 in Mid and West Wales. The much bigger rises for Plaid Cymru were in the three southwest regions, and particularly South Wales Central, uh, where of course Leanne Wood was herself standing. For the Conservatives, well, um, up until this year, of course, they'd had that record of improving their vote share and improving their seat numbers at every assembly election <laughs> thus far. Well, that pretty clearly and decisively came to an end this year, that run. So we see the Conservatives falling back in seat numbers and in terms of vote share on both ballots. Nonetheless, the Conservatives were still marginally second on constituency vote share, and they held all of their existing constituency seats, most of them actually pretty comfortably. Um, and if you look at the details of where the Conservatives were doing relatively better, relatively worse in terms of the constituency, at least, you know, they were getting some of their better constituency results in some of the sort of places which they were targeting. So I think it suggests not that the Conservatives you know, were running a fundamentally incompetent campaign. The problem is that you know, if you're seeing your vote share falling by almost four percentage points from last time, even if you're doing relatively better in the seats you're targeting, it's still difficult to actually make up sufficient ground to win in many places. Um, the big damage, though, to the Conservatives was done on the regional vote. And we look at the regional vote shares, and Mid and West Wales was the only region where the Conservatives did not come third on the regional ballot. Um, in South East, indeed, they came third behind not only Labour, but also behind UKIP. That brings us to the Assembly's newest party, UKIP, um, who clearly made a, a major advance this year, entering the Assembly for the first time and, of course, doing so in significant numbers. Uh, they very nearly matched their record at the general election last year of saving their deposit in every single constituency. The one exception this year was Cardiff Central, where Mohammed Sawal Islam fell just short of the 5% needed. And we look at the regional ballot, which was where the important action was always going to be for UKIP, then they had at least you know, double figure percentages on the regional vote in all of Wales' five regions. They did, though, have a particular concentration of support, just as they did in the general election last year, in South Wales East. And so if you look at the constituency ballots, there were five seats where UKIP won more than 20% of the vote on the constituency ballot. All five of those are in South Wales East. <laughs> and if you look at the regional vote shares, you know, they're sort of comfortably into double figures just about in, in all of the other ones, but in South East Wales, <coughs> close to 20%. So that has become something of a, of a concentration of support for UKIP and that region. Final point to make on UKIP, though, is, and you know, I have occasionally had since the election to remind one or two journalists in London that UKIP did actually come fourth in Wales. They didn't win the election. Um, uh, moreover, UKIP's vote share this year, even on the regional vote where they did a bit better, was actually down, not only on their vote share in the European election, and we wouldn't have expected UKIP to match that, but it was also down on their vote share in the general election last year. So, you know, the story of UKIP progress is, well, it's a bit more complicated than that. Finally, the Liberal Democrats. I did think of possibly just leaving this slide blank and calling for a moment's silence. Um, <laughs> and I like, as you've probably noticed, for all of the parties to mention something good, something not so good. It, it's really difficult, I'm afraid, to come up with positive news on the Liberal Democrats. You know, this was their worst ever assembly election result again, <laughs> after the last one, which was also their, had been their, their worst ever assembly election result. Um, and you could almost sort of take your pick of statistics which illustrate just how badly the party was doing. In the 2010 general election, the Liberal Democrats saved every deposit, and in fact they got more than 10% of the vote in every seat in Wales except for Anis Morn. 
Now they're losing their deposit in 26 of the 40 seats. Um, you know, it's a pretty desperate performance. And of course, you know, significant numbers of their candidates were getting utterly derisory numbers of votes. Um, and on the constituency ballot, as one or two other people have already pointed out, more than half of all votes cast for Liberal Democrats came in four seats, you know, the only four seats where they seem to be still serious players, Brecon and Radnor, Montgomery, Keradigian, and Cardiff Central. Uh, if you look at their constituency vote share changes from last time, other than Kirsty Williams' remarkable performance in Brecon and Radnor, Alid Roberts standing in Clwyd South was the only Liberal Democrat candidate in the whole of Wales who was able to manage a positive vote share change albeit that positive vote share change was from not very much last time to very slightly more <laughs> this time. Um, but still, um, that's, that's still a pretty remarkable performance by him. And you're seeing in seats like Newport East, Aberconwy, Wrexham, you know, seats which the Liberal Democrats haven't won in recent times, but in living memory of even the youngest person in this room, you know, the Liberal Democrats have been performing really strongly. You know, big losses in vote share going down to pretty pitiful levels in many cases. Meantime, other seats like Delin and a few others, you're only, you're only seeing small losses in Liberal Democrat vote share change because we were coming across what statisticians tend to refer to as floor effects, i.e. there's only so far it can fall. Um, so yeah, when, when they were starting at not much greater than zero, there's, there's only a certain uh, degree to which it can fall. And, and the final statistic I'll give you, which some of you might have seen on Twitter uh, about a week ago, across all of the UK's lawmaking parliaments now, so Westminster, the devolved, and the European Parliament, there are now only 15 elected Liberal Democrat members and 16 Ply Cymru members. And it's not as if Ply Cymru have been doing spectacularly well in recent years, yet there are still fewer Lib Dems elected across all of the UK's lawmaking parliaments now than, than Plaid Cymru members. It's a, a reflection on the pretty desperate times the party has faced and is facing. Okay. At the uh, pre-election seminar we did a couple of months ago, uh, I presented to people um, a series of slides based on this sort of template. So for each of the parties, what was the electoral battleground? What were the seats where they might be plausibly looking to gain? the seats where they're like plausibly under pressure and having to make an active defence, and then in more unlikely scenarios, seats that they might win if their electoral dreams were coming true, or seats they might lose in a sort of nightmare scenario. I thought it would be useful to run quickly through those slides again, because I think they tell a lot of the story of this election. Um, remind you, for each party, I've colour-coded the seats by you know, that party's main competitor in that seat, and I've highlighted a seat in bold if it changed hands. So for Labour, first of all, well, you know, in comparison with 2011, there were never any very plausible seat gains they were going to make, except possibly a North Wales list seat if they'd lost constituency seats in North Wales. The action, or the real action of the election, actually much of the story of the election, is in this bottom left-hand cell here. These first two seats... Labour was going into the election, holding them by majorities of fewer than 100. <coughs> the bottom four seats held by Labour in the Assembly but lost to the Conservatives at the general election last year. Cardiff North and Vale of Glamorgan lost quite decisively. And Labour held all of them. I mean, that's, that's seriously impressive. Um, you know, six very losable seats. In fact, you know, if Labour had lost all of those six seats... They wouldn't have won any list seats in, in compensation. So they would have been down at 23 seats. By far their worst ever performance in an assembly election result. You know, there you basically have a big part of the story of this year's election. Um, and the only, if we look at some of these seats I'd hi highlighted last time as sort of more implausible Labour losses, you know, the Conservatives in a few seats they talked up didn't really come anywhere close. And somewhat surprisingly, it was actually Plaid Cymru in these seats, who put Labour under pressure? There was even Blanai Gwent, which I wouldn't have classified even as a stretch goal. As more, I would have had to invent a third column for Blanai Gwent as, are you out of your effing mind? Um, <laughs> um, 
but it was in those seats where Labour was put under pressure, and of course the Ronda, the, on, the only one that actually changed hands. We see almost the reverse picture with the Conservatives. Five very plausible constituency target seats. You know, those four I've just mentioned targeting from Labour, plus Brecon and Radnor, which of course the Conservatives won quite decisively at the general election last year. And they won none of them. Um, nor did they come really anywhere close in these more sort of stretch goals. They did hang on to, indeed actually won quite decisively, these two potentially vulnerable constituency seats. But it was on the regional lists where the damage was really done to the Conservatives. As I mentioned in the pre-election briefing, the Conservatives had won two list seats in four of the Welsh regions last time, and particularly with the rise of UKIP, the second list seat in the, all of those regions was very much vulnerable. And in North Wales, in South Wales West, and in South Wales East, all of those seats were picked off. And indeed, that the second list seat in South Wales Central would have been picked off, but for Leanne Wood's victory in the Ronda. Um, so there, again, is a big part of the story of this year's election. For Plaid Cymru, well, again, it's this thing about a very patchy performance. The three obvious constituency targets, none of them won. You know, a, a pretty respectable, strong performance in Aberconwy, the other two seeing you know, significant declines in the vote share. And it was actually in the longer shot you know, targets, as I say, Philly, one of the Cardiff West, and Blood Eye Gwent, which I didn't even think to put on the slide before the election, where Plaid was seeing you know, their, their bigger vote gains, their bigger advances. Plaid did win a second list seat in South Wales West. You would have won one in, another one in South Wales Central, but for the victory in the Ronda. But their second list seat in South Wales East was always vulnerable to UKIP and indeed was picked off. So effectively, they swapped a South Wales West list seat for a South Wales East one. Ronda was the, the sole gain. For the Liberal Democrats, well, um, you know, they performed respectably, but without actually winning in the, these three constituencies. Of course, they held very decisively Brecon and Radnor, but they'd won the last list seat in North Wales, Mid and West Wales, South Wales, West and South Wales Central last time. As I mentioned two months ago, those list seats were all obviously vulnerable, and they all went. And in fact, Except for the Mid and West Wales list seats, not, the Liberal Democrats weren't even very close to hanging on to any of those list seats. And for UKIP, it was a nice, simple story. Um, had nothing to lose. They won one list seat in every region and a second one in a couple of regions. So, so that's roughly what happened. Now, a few thoughts on why it happened. We have um, data from the Welsh Election Study. I must uh, mention a brief word about our sponsors, the Economic and Social Research Council. It's given us a major grant to conduct a lot of this research. We're doing, as some of you will have seen, studies not only of voters, but also of local campaigning and social media. If anyone out here is a local constituency agent who hasn't yet filled out our local campaigning survey, please do so. Um, but anyway, today, I'm just going to present you some evidence from the voter study. We ran a big survey of voters before the campaign started. We then ran a second wave of a voter study sort of through the campaign period, the last 30 days before the election. And then we ran a big survey immediately after the election. And I'm going to present you some data. It's drawn from the campaign wave and the post-election wave. Both of these are surveys with fairly large sample sizes, more than 3,000 respondents, um, with all the work, as per usual, conducted by YouGov. The one thing I'll just mention as a sort of little bit of an excuse is we only got the post-election wave data at lunchtime yesterday. So I haven't had a huge amount of sleep, and um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot more work to be done in, in pouring through this. I'm just going to present you some initial and I think interesting findings on this. So what are we going to look at? I mean, any election, I think there's a combination of long-term and short-term factors you can look at to explain why parties have done more or less well. The longer-term factors are more about you know, the fundamental ways in which people think about and understand political parties, their, their basic 
often quite deep-rooted attitudes towards those parties. And then shorter-term factors that can shape whether people vote and how they vote include things like the impact of leaders, the campaigning efforts of the parties, and policies. And by policy, I mean either specific things that parties propose or their credibility and the extent to which voters trust them to actually deliver in key policy areas. So let's look at a few uh, indicators of the public's <laughs> state of mind with regard to some of these factors. And I'll start off with broad attitudes towards the political parties. And the first thing I'm going to show you is a few slides related to, um, we just asked people a simple question, how do you feel about all of the political parties on a zero to 10 scale? Where zero means strongly dislike, 10 means strongly like, so, you know, how would you evaluate each of the political parties? It's a useful summary measure of, of people's feelings. So I'll show you first of all, the proportion of all of our sample in the post-election survey who scored each party at a zero. You know, they really, really dislike this party. So the winners here, the winners of the contest you don't want to win, perhaps unsurprisingly, are UKIP. Fully two-fifths of all of our sample scored UKIP zero out of ten. That's probably not too surprising, although it's a bit higher than UKIP were five years ago. Um, I think the more notable feature of this is the not much lower score of the Conservatives. And that is several percentage points higher on this zero, to, zero out of ten than they were five years ago. Yeah. Attitudes towards the Conservatives have become more negative. Meanwhile, hostility has declined a bit towards the Liberal Democrats. That's about the one bit of good news I can find for them in, in the whole of our data set. Um, you then look um, generally at sort of you know, the average ratings out of 10. Um, Labour is in the lead. On average, you know, voters are most positive about the Labour Party. But note also that Plaid come you're in a, a pretty decent second place. Uh, and I think note again the pretty poor performance of the Conservatives only just being ahead of UKIP on average. And if we look directly at the changes this represents from 2011, I think this is also this is interesting. Yeah. Okay. Tiny little bit of good news here for the Liberal Democrats. They're up by a smidgen. Um, probably the other parties are, are down a smidgen. Quite a big decline for the Labour Party. But I think that mainly reflects simply just how extraordinarily well Labour was doing five years ago when they were you know, a long way ahead of any of the other political parties. But certainly warmth of feeling towards the Labour Party had declined appreciably over the last five years. Okay. Another way of asking about the political parties is to ask voters whose sort of interests do you think these, these parties are concerned with, with representing. So we, we, we asked a question format, which went, you know, to how much does each of these parties look after the interests of and then we gave them a series of options. And I'll show you a series of slides here, starting off with how much each of them, the interests of working class people. Um, people were able to say a great deal, a fair amount, not very much, and none at all. So I just aggregated the proportions who gave you know, a great deal or a fair amount for each party. So for working class people, perhaps unsurprisingly, Labour comes out best. But again, Ply Cymru in a fairly decent second place, Again, a really poor showing for the Conservatives. We then asked about English people in Wales. I, I kind of thought that the Conservatives and UKIP might form really strongly here. Actually, Labour comes out marginally ahead. Um, we then asked people who speak Welsh. Well, unsurprisingly, Ply Cymru do really well there. Yeah, God, I mean, you're not going to be staggering out of this room stunned by that result, I suspect. Um, but again, you know, Labour in a, a reasonable -ish second place there. Uh, we then asked wealthy people. This was the only category amongst whom the Conservatives scored really well. And I'm not sure that's a category you necessarily want to be scoring really well amongst. This is a Conservatives seen as being concerned with the interests of wealthy people, um, way ahead of any other party. Then asked Welsh people in general, whatever that means, again, deliberately somewhat vague. 
Again, you'd expect Ply Cymru to score well there, but Labour also scores pretty well. Again, the Conservatives doing notably quite badly. And then finally, a deliberately very vague category of people like you, <laughs> whatever that means. And we deliberately left it vague for people to interpret. Overall, again, Labour in the strongest position. Again, Ply doing pretty well. And note, again, a poor performance by the Conservatives and declining appreciably from when we asked this question uh, five years ago. Finally, we asked a series of questions which have been used by the... I should just go back here a second. A series of questions which have um, been used by the British Election Study about emotional responses to the parties. We said, you know, do the parties make you feel? And we gave a couple of positive emotions, a couple of negative emotions, and said, well, you know, which of these emotions applies to which of the parties? So, first of all, which, um, do you feel angry any of the parties? Look how many people are saying the Conservatives make them feel angry. Not that far short of half the entire sample. You know, that, that's not good news. Um, you know, far more even than, than UKIP. While we notice for, for Labour and even more so for Plaid Cymru, very few people being made angry by, by those parties. Okay. How about hopeful? UP. Um, well, Labour's doing best there. Again, Plaid in a fairly decent second place. Uh, Green is also doing respectively the other parties a bit further behind. Also then asked about afraid. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly UKIP scores highest there. A little bit surprising given all the other results, actually Labour scores slightly higher than, than uh, the Conservatives there. Not many people are afraid of Liberal Democrats or the Greens. And finally, proud. Well, this, this, initially this slide looks great for Plaid Cymru, except when you, when you look on the left, actually that's only 11% of people. Uh, so not many people felt proud of any of the parties, but at least Plaid was doing relatively best there, Labour second best. So I mean, overall, I think those, you know, the evidence for attitudes to the parties, I think it's particularly revealing about the Conservative Party, that attitudes seem pretty negative uh, among many different ways of measuring things. Um, but also, you know, both the Labour Party and Plaid Cymru, quite a lot of positive sentiment towards them. De the degree of warmth towards the Labour Party has fallen over the last few years, but they're still doing, still doing pretty well as, as are Plaid Cymru. Right, um, party leadership, another thing to talk about. Uh, academics used to argue about whether party leaders mattered in elections in parliamentary-type political systems. We don't anymore, generally. So one of the few academic arguments that's pretty much been settled, they do matter. In devolved elections, though, there's been an interesting question about which leaders. Uh, and in some research that we did after the 2011 devolved elections, we found, interestingly, that in, in Scotland, attitudes towards UK-level party leaders seemed basically irrelevant to how people voted. In Wales, though, they didn't. Attitudes to both the Welsh-level leaders, but also UK-level party leaders, were important in, in helping shape the way that people made their, their voting choices in the end. So we've asked quite a lot of questions about leadership, many of them asking about not just the Welsh leaders, but also the UK-level party leaders. And here's a bit of evidence about that. First of all, just the simple 0 to 10 ratings. Um, how many, you know, where did people put the leaders on a, on a scale from zero, being strongly disliked, to 10, strongly like? This is all the leaders here, so I know there's quite a few bars there for you to get into your head. Um, point out a few things. First of all, the leader who is top by, by this time this survey conducted straight after the election is Leanne Wood. It's the first time we've seen her in a clear lead amongst all of these leaders. Secondly came Carwin Jones, um, still performing pretty strongly. But five years ago, Carwin Jones was almost up at six out of ten. And, you know, Carwin Jones was still an electoral asset to Labour this year, but you know, as tends to happen to people when they're holding high office for several years, you know, his popularity has declined uh, by just, just over a point on this 11-point on this scale. Kirsty Williams, so that's the other bit of good news for Liberal Democrats in all of this data, 
despite a dreadful election for her party, Kirsty Williams was still pretty positively evaluated, certainly compared to the other leaders. But the other thing which I think is really important here is right over here. This is David Cameron, averaging barely above three out of ten. And there's been a noticeable decline in Cameron's ratings in recent months in Wales. At the general election last year, I think even in Wales, David Cameron was an electoral asset to the Conservative Party. This year, I think he, he wasn't. And I think one of the problems maybe with the Conservative campaign was that they possibly didn't adjust quickly enough to the fact that Cameron had actually become, I think, with many voters, an electoral liability. So, for instance, a couple of the, I think it was the last two Conservative Party election broadcasts, closed with a lengthy direct-to-camera appeal by David Cameron. Do you really want to have just about the most unpopular party leader in, in Wales as the closing note on your party election broadcast? Maybe not. Okay, we asked one or two other questions as well about leaders. First of all, we asked, which one would make the best first minister? Five years ago when we asked this question, Carl Wynne Jones was almost <coughs> embarrassingly far ahead of all of the other leaders. I think he's got about five times as many mentions as the next closest leader, who was Kirsty Williams and about seven times as many as the leader of Plaid Cymru, Ian Wynne-Jones. Now, we actually see him more or less dead-heating with Leanne Wood. In fact, Ma Leanne Wood is marginally ahead, albeit you know, that's well within sort of the boundaries of sampling error. Okay, lots of people say don't know, so suppose you overall count this as a landslide victory for the don't knows, but of those who had a view, Leanne Wood was every, at very least matching Carl Wynne-Jones the other party leaders being quite a long way behind. And when we asked which leader performed best in the campaign out of the Welsh leaders, again, there was a lot of don't knows. A lot of those with a clear view. There was one pretty clear winner. And that actually wasn't the leader of the party that came first. It was Leanne Wood of Plaid Cymru. So I think we can certainly take from this that, you know, I, I suspect, and we'll, we'll pour through this more with some more detailed statistical modelling, I think Carwin Jones was still overall an electoral asset for Labour, but significantly less so than he had been five years ago. And whereas five years ago, Plaid Cymru's leader was frankly an electoral hindrance to them, this time round, Leanne Wood was certainly doing no harm and indeed probably quite a lot of good to Plaid Cymru's electoral prospects. Okay. One or two more things. First of all, the campaigning activities. Um, we have quite a lot of evidence about this, which is going to require some detailed unpicking. So I'll just so show you one or two basic statistics. First of all, how many people were contacted in the election campaign. On our sample, actually quite a lot by the end of the campaign. More than 40% reported they'd been contacted by one of the parties. Now, there are various forms of contact. We have all sorts of details in the survey about who was leafleted, who was telephoned, how many times they were contacted. And we'll, We'll explore that in, in the future. But basically, you know, a lot of people were contacted. More were not. And about 7% didn't know. Um, they couldn't quite tell the difference between a Labour Party leaflet and a pizza advert for pizza <laughs> delivery or something. I don't know. Um, but anyway. Um, but you know, then in terms of the overall sort of activity levels of the parties, um, which parties contacted people the most? And we see Labour come out clearly ahead. Plaid Cymru in a decent second place, the Conservatives third. The Liberal Democrats actually fourth. UKIP a long way behind in fifth. And then, and then the Greens. So, I mean, obviously we'll spend a lot more time looking at this evidence in detail. But you know, we do know from all sorts of evidence that campaigning efforts do generally yield some sort of reward. So I think you know, one of the factors behind Labour getting the votes out where it needed them may well have been the fact that it had the most active campaign on the ground. When we asked though which party ran the best campaign, well, again, another landslide victory for the don't knows. <laughs> of those who had a view, though, Plaid Cymru marginally head of Labour. Only around 5% of people thinking the Conservatives had the best campaign, and similarly, actually very marginally behind the person who thought that UKIP had the best campaign. So I think clearly not a successful campaign period for the Conservatives. But also, I mean, again, when we ran this, we had this question five years ago, Labour, again, here, were embarrassingly far ahead of all of the other parties. They weren't this time. 
Finally, on, on policy, um, just, just mention that uh, yeah, there are all sorts of different ways of asking about policy. Um, just going to show you a few slides here about the extent to which the parties were trusted on some of the major, some of the major issues. Uh, to deal with, for instance, the economy. You know, this, this is interesting, I think, that Labour are not in a clear lead ahead of the Conservatives. You know, in many respects, you know, Labour are more posi much more posi positively evaluated than the Conservatives in Wales. On the economy, though, things are still sort of neck and neck between those two parties. Um, immigration, yes, we asked about immigration, even though, yes, I know it's not a devolved issue, but um, it's one of the things which came out a lot in our Welsh political barometer polls. Even when you ask people about major issues specifically related to the Assembly election, lots of people still mention immigration. Which parties are seen as you know, the best to handle it? Well, UKIP do quite well here. Um, you know, miles ahead of anyone else. Uh, Labour, second place. You know, immigration traditionally was a Conservative issue. We're not doing so well on that now. Um, health. Labour still ahead, Clyde in second place. I mean, one, of the, one of the issues, I think, in, the, in their campaign was that the Conservatives wanted to hit the Labour Party quite hard over the record over the Welsh NHS. But, of course, every time they sought to do so, Carwyn Jones could just come back and say, well, there's no junior doctor strike in Wales. Um, and so the Conservatives clearly not doing, doing too well on this issue. Education, also the Labour Party still the most trusted party. Um, and finally, a somewhat amorphous category of standing up for Wales' interests. Well, Ply Cymru does very well here, but Labour's still in a decent second place. Um, perhaps one issue for Ply Cymru is that this issue was not, was, was not a sufficient salience to, to many voters. Right. And finally, my very final slide. Um, th this is a final, I think, important thing in terms of understanding the election result we got particularly about why Plaid Cymru did not do better, given that when you ask people about their attitudes towards Plaid Cymru, they generally do pretty well on, on, on many ways of measuring things. So we looked at those people on the 0 to 10 scale in terms of attitudes to parties, those who ranked a party between 8 and 10. So you felt pretty positively about that party. Now, what proportion of those people actually voted for that party on the constituency ballot? So you see here, for the Conservative and Labour Party, it's close to 80%. They're, they're getting a lot of their potential support to actually come out and vote for that party on the day. <laughs> for the poor Liberal Democrats, there aren't that many people who even feel positively about them anymore. And even those that do, most of them don't vote for them. Um, <laughs> but look at Plaid Cymru. Um, I mean, they're doing better than they were five years ago. Five years ago, they were almost at the level of the Liberal Democrats on this chart. But still, of those people who feel positively about Plaid Cymru, they're still only getting about three-fifths of them to actually come out and turn those positive attitudes into votes. And so if Plaid are ever to seriously challenge Labour for being you know, the leading party in the Assembly, they have to become much more successful at converting positive attitudes into votes to be getting this bar be somewhere up here. Um, they've made some progress in the last five years, but clearly not enough. I think that's enough for me for now. Um, I'm now going to be joined by Catherine Harve-Jones of ITV Cymru Wales for some Q&A.